You know, we're gathered here today as the people of God, much like we do every Sunday. But today is just a little different, isn't it? Today, uh, we, we come here with the realization that our world is not a safe place. And I guess we always knew that, but uh, we are reminded that uh, the world can be a scary place. And I guess if there's one word that we could use to describe our world right now, it would be the word fear. Don't you think? Uh, there is so much fear that is all around us. And not that we don't have a reason to, to be careful and to, to understand that there are some scary things out there. There is. But we understand also that this is not the first time that our world has been bombarded by disease or or some kind of uh, threatening force. Our nation alone has seen a lot of tough times. And most of the people that are living today uh, is have not really seen those kind of times. They haven't lived through uh, things like World War I and World War II, the Great Depression. Um, and so, most people don't know what it's like to live in that kind of world, and we're beginning to feel that just a little bit. We got a glimpse of it at 9-11, and then we saw people go back to their normal lives as if nothing happened. But every now and then, things come along that kind of change our perspective. And so today, things are just a little different on this Sunday. It seems like to me that every word of every song has a greater meaning. Whereas usually we're singing these songs and probably thinking about what we're going to do afterwards, there's something about a crisis that causes us to think about what's really important. And so as we sing these songs and we hear the prayers and we, we hear the people sing and Sandy sing and different things, they take on a whole new meaning. And I can only think of the people of God in tough times of their life, times like the Black Death in the 1300s when millions of people died and populations were wiped out. And only people had only a 50-50 chance to live. How faith and the people of God, what did they do during those times? I think the people who really knew God continued to follow God. And so I felt led to change the sermon this morning. And so I wrote kind of a Saturday night sermon. Uh, I don't normally do that, but I, in light of everything, I felt led to do that this morning. And so the scripture reading today is not from Psalm 95 as we had planned, but Psalm 27. Feel free to turn there if you'd like. I will read it. Uh, but the scripture begins by saying, The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? Last night, I received an email, like many pastors did, from our district superintendent. This was after the bishop and the superintendent and the governor had suggested that people uh, stay away from each other and not have meetings and things. And the district superintendent, Brad, said that uh, I know some of you will, will uh, not hold services and some of you will. And I want to send a special word out to your pastors and know that I'm praying for you. And I know that you're going to give a word of hope for your people. And as I read that note, I had pretty much just finished my sermon and I realized I, had, I think that's what I wanted to do today. That's my goal. And you know, 
there may come a time when we as a people of God, when we as a church, there may come a time where we say, well, we, we can't have services tomorrow. Be it weather, uh, be it disease, whatever. But if we do, it will be because we as a church body have made that decision, not because the governor or the bishop or anyone else. And I respect them very much. But we will make that decision. And I've always told people in times of if it's bad weather or whatever, and if we have service, please use your own judgment. Please use your own judgment. And, uh, you know, you know yourself better than, than anyone else. But as I read these words, I want to read it again. Because maybe, maybe we didn't quite get it. Just think of the words that, uh, that we're reading here. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? Are these just words on a page? Are these just pretty words to make us feel better? Or are these the words of life? Are these words that God has used from time and eternity to help people in times of crisis? What do we really have to fear? So, somebody said, the old saying, you know, the only thing we have to fear is fear itself. But what is it we really have to fear? Death? Fear death? And why do we fear death? Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life, and he that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. The question is, do we really believe what God says? I mean, death is really our ticket out of this crazy world. And I'm not saying that we should, uh, you know... Want to die today. None of us in, our sound, in a sound body of mind want to just die today. But at the same time, we realize that there are worse things than death for the Christian. I say that to people and they look at me kind of funny, but there really are. Suffering is worse than death. I see people in great, great suffering from cancer that's wrecked their bodies and other diseases and how it's ravaged their body and to their skin and bones. I saw my little sister after she went through a time of remission go to a time, through a time of great suffering. So I finally went to God and I said, God, if you're not going to heal her, take her home. Just take her home. There are worse things than death. If we believe the words of Jesus, we're going to be with God for eternity. What could be better? Now, if you're not a Christian, I understand your fears. When I work at the hospital and I work in rooms where people have died and, and people are dying and they don't have that hope, I, I, I see a fear within them that's not within some of the other people that I know that are Christians. I understand that fear. But you can do something about that. You can do it before you leave this building if you don't know that Jesus is your Savior. You can, before you walk out those doors, I encourage you to do something about that today. You know, there's something about being in the presence of God and His people that really does help bring relief to a troubled heart and a troubled soul. And that's why we needed to be here today. That's why we need to gather as a people of God today because in a time of crisis, in a time when the world is seemingly going crazy and bad things are happening all around us, the one thing that we want our people to do is to gather in a place where we can worship God. And as I said, there may be times where that won't be possible. To be honest with you, there, there may become a time when, when the governor does lock the doors. 
when the uh, powers that be say that we can no longer meet in an assembly like this and we have to meet in an underground format as they once did. That scares me more than the virus, to be honest with you. And what I'm saying today is that we have had it so good for so long. The American people have been blessed beyond measure. And I think that a small part of that, or maybe a big part of that, is because we have had the protection of God upon us. I'm not saying, don't, don't get me wrong, I'm not saying that, that God is up there causing people to get sick. But there is something to this that we understand that, uh, you know, that, that the Bible teaches that, that there is a protection of God over His people. And the reality is that we see the results of a sin-cursed world when people die. Every time you see somebody die, it's a result of a sin-cursed world. Death and disease are a part of us, and they have been ever since the beginning. And we all <laughs> carry with us that Adamic nature. Look at verse 4 in this passage. One thing I ask of the Lord, and that I will seek after, to live in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. To behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in His temple. I've read those words a thousand times. But last night I read it in a different way. What does it mean to live in the house of the Lord? David said, I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. What does that mean? Well, you know that when we ask someone over for dinner and we have a guest, they don't re usually bring all their stuff and all their clothes because they're just coming over for a little while. They're not planning on staying long. So to dwell with someone means that you're taking up residence. You're moving in. And to dwell with God and to dwell with God's people means that we're, in a sense, in the presence of God. We're going to dwell in the presence of God. It's not that we're just coming here today for church, and that's the presence of God for the week. But the people of God dwell in the presence of God every day and every night. And I know, and you know, that if God willing... I lay my head down at night. I will, wake my, oh, I will wake up in the morning. We used to pray that prayer, and it's a little scary for probably if you think about it today. My grandma taught me that prayer. Uh, now I lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord my soul to keep. Say it with me. I, now I lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord my soul to keep. I pray the Lord my soul to take. You know, there's some truth in that. Because the reality of it is that each and every one of us are, are in God's hands. And we might not make it through another day. We might, be, uh, we might be taken out of this world today. We have no promise of tomorrow. But I'm so glad today that my trust is not in how precautious I am. Although I want to be very cautious. And my trust is not in my government and how much information they give us and how good they are at quarantine. And I hope our government does the right thing. But that's not where my faith is today. My faith is in a God and I will be like the people on the Titanic that went down singing, Nearer my God to thee. Because I believe today that there's nothing more important I really do than what we're doing right now. There's nothing more important. And there may come a time when uh, I come here and it's just me and maybe Andy will record it and then we're, you guys stay home and watch it on, on the internet or something or on YouTube. But for now, I'm glad we're here, aren't you? Amen? Can you say amen? Amen. amen. 
So to, to dwell in the house of the Lord means that we are in the presence of God, that we have moved in with God in a sense, and we take Him wherever we go. I have a quote from uh, Brother Lawrence. I think it will be on the screen. Uh, listen to the words of Brother Lawrence, the practice of the presence of God. He does not ask much of us, merely a thought of Him from time to time, a little act of adoration, sometimes to ask for His grace, sometimes to offer Him your sufferings, at other times to thank Him for the graces, past and present. He has bestowed on you in the midst of your troubles to take solace in Him as often as you can. Lift up your heart to Him during your meals and in company. The least little remembrance will always be most pleasing to Him. One need not cry out very loudly, He is nearer to us than we think. The presence of God. Brother Lawrence taught that you can practice the presence of God while you're washing your dishes, while you're, while you're doing your chores and going about your daily life. It is the presence of God that goes with you wherever you go. David said, yea, though I'll walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I'll fear no evil. Why? Because thou art with me. And someday God's going to knock on my door. And he says, it's, it's time to come home. And I hope I'll say on that day, even so, come Lord Jesus. That's why we're here today. To remind, be reminded once again that God is still in control. And we're still His people. I visited a young man in his 30s in the hospital who has a lot of health issues, not the coronavirus. We'll call him John. And I went to John's room and John had been in the hospital for a long, several months. And uh, John told me he was scared. And I said, John, what is it you're afraid of? And he said, I'm afraid of dying. And he said, I am, uh, I'm not where I need to be with God. I said, have you made your peace with God? He said, no, I haven't. And then after talking to him, I asked him, uh, you know, why he hadn't done that. And he began to give me all these reasons why he felt like he could not live the Christian life. He said, I have uh, not been a good person. I've not always been kind. And I haven't taken care of myself. And part of the reason I'm in the shape I'm in is simply because I know I didn't take care of myself. But he said, I, I want to be a Christian, but he said, I, I just don't think I can live it. I don't think I can be perfect. I have a bad habit of, of cursing, and I'm just not a good, I just don't know if I can do it. And I said to him, John, I said, listen, God knows that none of us are perfect. God knows that we're going to make mistakes probably every day. And I told him about the prodigal son and how that God, uh, the, who, the father who represented God, came and ran to him and kissed him. That's the kind of God I want you to see, John. You've got this picture of John. And see, I found out by talking that he had this, he had grown up in a background in a church who preached more and focused more on the hellfire of God and on the wrath of God than they did the love of God to the point where he felt like that he could not even approach this God. And I'm sorry, but if that's the kind of God that you think he is, then uh, I, I think that's a misunderstanding. Because the God that I see is that God that Jesus talked about. Not a God that's waiting for us to mess up so He can stamp us out. But a God who's waiting for us to come home. And He's going to run to meet us. He's not going to say, you are not worthy of my love. He's going to say, where have you been? I've been waiting. And I said, John, none of us are perfect. But you take God, and, and I said, you know, it's kind of like this. When you go to an amusement ride, they have these, uh, you got to be this tall to ride a ride. Or you don't, if you don't measure up to that, you don't get to ride it. 
I said, but guess what? In God's measurement, where you come short, the grace of God makes up for it. Aren't you glad of that? Right then and there, I said, would you like to pray? And he prayed and accepted Jesus. His mother, all this time, had went, uh, stepped out of the room so we could be alone. And then she came back as we were praying. And I looked up after we prayed. She had tears coming down her eyes. And I said, what about you? Have you come to know the Lord as your Savior? She said, no. And I said, would you like to? And she stood there for a minute and thought... And her son said, Mom, if you're not ready, it's okay. Don't, you know, don't do it until you're ready. And, and she looked at me and said, I'm ready. And she gave her life to God. And what a wonderful day for a mother and a son to come to God. The next day I went in the room and he's sitting in a chair with a smile on his face. And he said, I don't care what happens now. I'm with God. And what I'm here to tell you today is that there's nothing more important today than for us to understand that God is in control, that God is still saving, and God is still forgiving, and we as a people of God are going about as business as usual because God hasn't stopped yet. And the Holy Spirit hasn't stopped yet. God is still saving souls, and He's still on the throne, and He's still God. Let's pray. Dear Father, as we come before you today, I just want to ask you to help us. To help us, Lord, to work through our fears, our anxieties, and God, uh, whatever comes our way, be it sickness, be at wars, be it heartache, or be it death. To God be the glory. Amen.